So hello everybody, my name is Mike Hamblin, and I'm giving the keynote address here, which is the history and mechanisms of photobiomodulation with a focus on the treatment of brain disorders. The outline of the talk, a few slides about the history of photobiomodulation, a few slides about the mechanism, um, a fair bit about animal models of brain disorders treated with PBM, and quite a bit about clinical studies. So the history of photobiomodulation <clears throat> goes all the way back more than 100 years ago to when Neil Svinson won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1903. And you can see that he died one year later after he won the Nobel Prize. And in his lecture, he said he had Newman-Pick disease and he found that going out in the sunlight really helped his medical condition. Um, so that motivated him to do research into treating diseases with light and he built some uh, fancy arc lamps to treat people. Um, so this Nobel Prize kind of spurred uh, the medical community into thinking about light therapy. And in those, you know, this was the introduction of electric lighting, because Edison had invented the light bulb a few years before that, but never mind. <laughs> it was becoming common at that time, electric lights. And because of Finson's Nobel Prize, people started to build electric light bars to treat all sorts of diseases and conditions, including John Harvey Kellogg, who invented Kellogg's cornflakes, of course, he was a great believer in natural medicine. And he had these electric light bars that people would sit in or lie in to be treated for all sorts of, of diseases and conditions. Uh, serious things like heart attacks, and, but injuries and infections. Um, August Rollier built a clinic in the Alps to treat people with heliotherapy, sunlight therapy. And you can see they're all out in the snow up in the Alps. And Rollier said he regarded exposure to the sun with temperatures above 18 degrees as a hot air bath and not a sun bath. Um, so that's one reason why going up in the Alps or the mountains is good for heliotherapy. Um, so now, going forward a few decades, we come into the 50s when there was the race to build the first working laser, won by Ted Maiman, who built a ruby laser. Very shortly after that, Paul McGuff had a ruby laser and he treated tumours in both mice and humans with the ruby laser beam, published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. But over in Hungary, Andre Mester developed an interest in laser research, and he also got a ruby laser, tried to repeat Paul McGuff's anti-tumor laser treatment, but his laser wasn't anything like as powerful as McGuff's laser, so it didn't work. And then he tried to see if the laser could cause skin cancer in mice, and that didn't work either but he did observe increased hair growth and better wound healing in the mice, and in fact, in people. So that's the history. Let's talk a bit about the mechanisms. And over the years since uh, Ted Maiman and laser therapy, a lot of people, including Tina Karu in Russia, but many others have come to the conclusion that the mitochondria or the powerhouse of the cells are the main photoacceptor for this red and near infrared light. And you get more oxygen consumed, you get raised mitochondrial membrane potential, more ATP, you get nitric oxide release and a brief burst of reactive oxygen species. Um, here I've shown you uh, cytochrome C oxidase, because one hypothesis is that the light can photodissociate inhibitory nitric oxide from the cytochrome C oxidase and allow respiration ATP to increase. Despite 
a lot of people trying to prove this hypothesis. It hasn't actually yet been proved. But nevertheless, the mitochondria stimulated oxidative phosphorylation is increased. And so if the mitochondria were carrying out glycolysis, they undergo a metabolic switch. Um, so you get all these things happening in the mitochondria, more ATP, cyclic AMP, ROS, nitric oxide release. And these primary mediators can cause a cascade of signaling that involves gene transcription. So June FOS and NF-kappa B are highly pleiotropic transcription factors and can trigger the expression of many, many genes, over a hundred different genes. Um, also, nitric oxide does a lot of signaling that can involve gene transcription as well. So you have all these powerful signaling events going on in the mitochondria, and the results are things like pro-survival, cell proliferation motility, more extracellular matrix, more growth factors, so many, many beneficial things. As I said, one of the major effects is this mitochondrial switch from glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation. And this has two important consequences. The first one involves activation of stem cells. So when the stem cells are in their hypoxic niche, they carry out glycolysis. When the mitochondria are activated, the stem cells need oxygen, so they have to get out of their niche in search of oxygen. And once they come out, they encounter cues in the tissue which activate their proliferation and differentiation programs. And they're basically told where to go in the body to heal and repair the tissue. And some people have heard of exogenous stem cell therapy, but this is endogenous stem cell therapy. It's much better to activate the endogenous stem cells rather than trying to inject them from outside. So the other consequence is anti-inflammatory. The macrophages of an M1 phenotype are very pro-inflammatory and they carry out glycolysis as their metabolic, metabolic pathway. But when oxidative phosphorylation is activated, they switch to an M2 phenotype, which is anti-inflammatory. Not only is it anti-inflammatory, but these M2 macrophages or microglia as they are in the brain can phagocytose stuff, i.e. clear rubbish, such as amyloid plaque, but other build up sort of protein deposits that need to be gotten rid of. Um, so another mechanism is to do with heat-gated and light-gated TRP ion channels. So these are calcium ion channels, TRP's transient receptor potential. There are many, many of them. Um, but some of them are activated by blue and green light via opsins, which are light-sensitive proteins. And this switches open the ion channel and calcium comes in. However, some near-infrared wavelengths, in particular 980 nanometers, are absorbed by water in the membranes, and that gives a conformational change, which also opens the ion channel. So both of these will allow calcium to move around inside the cell, but it also affects mitochondria. So you get the ROS and the ATP from the mitochondria because you've allowed the calcium to move around. As another me possible mechanism, which has been proposed by one or two folks, that because ATP synthase in the mitochondria is a molecular rotor, you, know, you see it whizzing around, that uh, the interfacial water absorbs the energy, increases its vibration, and decreases the viscosity. So this allows the rotor to whiz around faster and make more ATP. Um, so it was recently discovered just a couple of years ago that blood contains circulating cell-free mitochondria, which nobody had managed to notice 
despite hundreds of years of studying the blood. And said, does the blood we thought to know so well contain elements that have been undetectable until now? So the hypothesis is you've got these mitochondria in the blood that can absorb light and then move around the body. So this explains why shining light on one part of the body can have effects on distant tissues, which has always been a bit puzzling. Nevertheless, most people who are doing photobiomodulation like to shine the light on the tissue that needs healing or regenerating. And to do that, you need the light to go inside the tissue. And there is this tissue optical window, which is red and near infrared wavelengths. And you know, most people who do PBM will use light in this tissue optical window because it penetrates into the body because there's absorption on this side and this side, so you have to be in the middle. There is a phenomenon of the biphasic dose response. So you shine a bit of light, it works. Shine some more light, it works better. If you keep shining more light, it stops working so good. If you shine a lot of light, it may even have a harmful effect. Although you, you need a very large amount of light to have a harmful effect, but there is an optimum amount of light. And this explains why some studies in photobiomodulation have failed, not because you haven't used enough light, but because you've used too much light. Okay, so uh, talk about some of the animal studies that my laboratory did over the years. Uh, we had funding to work on traumatic brain injury from the US Department of Defense, who were very interested in TBI. And in this study, we had four different lasers, different wavelengths, and we used a closed head TBI model in mice. And what we found is we gave a single exposure of the mouse head to the laser. Four hours after the TBI, we dropped a weight on the head, and you see that the red laser, 665, single exposure, gave very beneficial effects that lasted for four weeks after the head injury. Very similar results with near infrared, 810 nanometers, four weeks single exposure. But two other wavelengths, 730 and 980, did not give any positive effects. And we were quite pleased at that because being photobiologists, we like to see a action spectrum so that certain wavelengths work because they're absorbed by tissue chromophores. We then decided to concentrate on the 810 nanometer wavelength and we got a different model of TBI in mice, which was much more controllable and called control cortical impact. Um, so again, a single treatment, 36 joules per square centimeter at 50 milliwatts per square centimeter. And this time, it's 810, this time we had three different pulse uh, regimens. It was either CW, 10 hertz or 100 hertz. So all of these work well compared to a treatment. But interestingly, the 10 hertz worked better than the CW and the 100 hertz. And since then, other workers have shown that pulsing the light at either 10 hertz or 40 hertz is beneficial, probably because it interacts with natural brain rhythm. So the alpha rhythm at 10 hertz and the gamma rhythm at 40 hertz. Um, we then went on to show that in this model, we could enhance learning and memory because you know, the previous data was just neurological function, but learning and memory is more important because it's actually cognitive function rather than just neurological function. And also that we could activate neuroprogenitor cells. So these neuroprogenitor cells are sometimes called neural stem cells, and they're very important for the brain. Um, so this is a classical Morris water maze that you use in mice because they have to remember where the hidden platform was 
and then they have to swim to it and they can't see it. So they have to navigate with markers on the it's four mark directional markers. So they have to remember and navigate basically. Um, so this shows that the, we actually compared one laser with three lasers on day one and day one, two, three. Um, but both these laser treatments were significantly improved, lowered the time the mouse needed to find the hidden platform. Um, so this is a immunohistochemistry study for uh, so-called neuroprogenitor cells, BR, BRDU, neuronin, double staining. Um, and these little green cells you can see here with the three laser treatment are important because they can regenerate the actual neurons in the brain. Um, using the same model, again, we looked at BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and we synaptogenesis. This is BDNF, again, showing that you can get increase of BDNF, this red markers here, and it's quantified in the graphs here. Specifically, it's seven days. And BDNF is probably the single most important molecule you can have in your brain because it's responsible for all sorts of things. Um, and our synapsin one is a marker of new connections. So neuroprogenitor cells are new brain cells being formed, but also you can form new connections between existing brain cells. And this is so-called neuroplasticity, which is the basic underlying mechanism of learning. So when you learn something, you actually form new connections between your cortical neurons. And here, this red marker is for the synapse. And one, again, it 28 days, skipped on them, but um, the fact you get more connections in the brain is very important. So the next study was that photobiomodulation had a big effect in mice that have had this uh, early response gene X1 deficiency, and they had much worse brain injury if they were hit on the head than normal mice. Um, and here you see that with the uh, knockout mice, these are the mice that are genetically engineered to have worse brain injuries, that the photobiomodulation could restore them back to the wild type mice, which is which is quite impressive actually, because you know with wild type mice there's a good effect, but with these knockout mice, there's a much better effect. And, you, know, you see the big hole in the brain and the knockout mice goes away when you do the photobiomodulation. So this is quite a big deal. And then we combine the photobiomodulation with metabolic in modulated. So part of the problem with the brain is that you know, it consumes a lot of your energy, your oxygen, your glucose, weight for weight, more than anything else in the body by far. Um, so what this is showing that adding metabolic inhibitors, particularly pyruvate, um, can benefit uh, the effects of photobiomodulation, both at the cellular level and at the tissue level. So here you see, what you doing? <laughs> Yeah, you see that um, photobiomodulation plus the pyruvate is better than the photobiomodulation alone. So this is an interesting animal model. What you do here, you have the mice in a bath of water and you have platforms. So if the platform is quite big compared to the size of the mouse, the mice are quite happy. They just sit on their platform. But if they have a tiny little platform, they can't go to sleep because they fall off. So they sleep deprived because they have to stay awake to sort of survive on their platform. And putting 810 nanometer light at 10 hertz um, once a day for three days 
had big effects on these sleep deprived mice, um, including in the sort of directional what, where, which test, you know, the ones that have the light, big change here. Barnes Mays test, almost back to normal, oxidative stress reduced. So sleep deprivation is a bad thing, you know. <laughs> it can wreak havoc with your brain, but you can restore it by putting near infrared light on the head. Um, this was a model of hypoxia ischemia at birth. So a lot of babies at birth have their brains deprived of oxygen. And this can give, cause brain damage that affects them for their whole life. And what you see here, this is the ATP, but putting the light on the head, it um, has big effects on various mazes, object recognition, Barnes maze. So this is the brain damage caused in the mice by being deprived of oxygen during birth, or shortly after birth in this case, can be benefited by putting light on their head. Um, animal models, we did a review of Parkinson's in animal models. We haven't specifically worked on Parkinson's disease, but lots of other people have because there are several animal models of Parkinson's disease. Um, so photobiomodulation can have beneficial effects on Parkinson's and animal models. So kind of summarize all the mechanisms that happen in the brain in animal models and even cell culture studies. Um, here you have your neuron. So photobiomodulation can prevent a dying, anti-apoptosis, survive and upregulation, make it migrate better. Antioxidants, anti-inflammatory. We showed the neurotrophins, the BDNF. We showed the neurogenesis, neuroprogenitor cells, and the synaptogenesis. Other people have shown increased angiogenesis, less swelling in the head, better lymphatic drainage, and increased blood flow, and better cerebral oxygenation. So as you can see, there are many, many different beneficial effects that can happen in the brain simply by putting red or near infrared light onto the head. LA clinical studies. Um, just a bit about the whole body before I get onto the brain in clinical studies, but there are many, many conditions, diseases all sorts of things that can be treated by photobiomodulation. You know, the tip of your head with both hair regrowth, but also the brain function that I'm talking about. Dentists, a lot of things in dentistry, TMJ, dentistry pain, uh, deafness in the ears, um, blindness in the eyes, oral mucositis, neck pain, Things inside the torso, lung inflammation, heart attack, uh, a kidney failure, a lot of things, orthopedic things, fractures, tennis elbow, uh, carpal tunnel, arthritis, uh, muscle fatigue all over the body, for athletic performance. Uh, you can mobilize stem cells from the bone marrow. Um, and even things like acupuncture, skin reju rejuvenation, pigmented spots. So many, many things in the body can be benefited by PBM. Many devices for doing PBM because of Ted Maiman and laser therapy. Um, you know, a lot of them are lasers. Some of them are quite high power lasers, but I think as time goes on, LEDs are becoming much more common. So because of this systemic effect that I mentioned, whole body photobiomodulation, the light beds and large panels and all sorts of things, become a lot of home use LED devices, usually sort of flexible arrays or 
can't tell the rays. Um, so let's talk a bit about clinical studies in the brain. Um, so Marni Nazer did one of the first studies in TBI some years ago. Uh, two case studies, both had chronic TBI. So one lady had a car crash seven years ago and had really been disabled for seven years. But when she started treating on the head with these LED clusters, uh, red and near infrared, her ability to do computer work had moved tenfold. So then she got home unit and used it daily at home. And this was another lady with multiple concussions and PTSD. Uh, again, had a home unit and her executive function and memory statistically improved and she could go back to work. So, you know, a lot of people you know, have a head injuries that kind of destroys their life. And it's possible that photobiomodulation, the head can get them pretty much back up to normal. Uh, this was the uh, stroop test on the second lady that had uh, statistical improvement in memory and in Stroop test, you know, you, you have a word whose font is different from its color. So you will see the word black printed in red font and you have to identify it. So it confuses a lot of people. Um, Marnie then went on to have a series of 11 patients with chronic TBI, um, treated them with this LED array to the head. And you see that um, out of these 11 patients, only three didn't respond. This one, this one, and this one. All the others had significant improvements to their life, quality of life, and their ability to do all sorts of things. So this was a controlled clinical trial at Mass General for acute TBI. And it was a difficult trial that took a long time to run because a lot of patients who were brought into Mass General with a head injury were recruited into other trials. And um, even then, you know, a lot of patients who brought in with a head injury actually go home the same night because they sort of recover a bit. So th these were people who had to stay in for uh, up to three days so to get treated with an active head helmet or a placebo helmet. But nevertheless, um, there were some results. Um, you know, they were only treated for up to one to three days after the head injury, but up to six months, they you know, improved significantly if they'd had the light therapy. But it took a while for the improvement to count, basically. Uh, this is the Violite uh, from Lou Lim, Toronto and Canada, small clinical trial for Alzheimer's. So this is LEDs that are positioned on particular parts of the head to interact with the default mode network. And um, here you see that um, it was started off to be a randomized trial, but what they found was that all the patients in the placebo group didn't improve and they dropped out. So only the patients getting the real photobiomodulation stayed in the trial and they had a big improvement in uh, uh, the two scores that they use for Alzheimer's, the uh, mini mental state exam and the ADS COG score. Um, treated, I think, three times a week for 12 weeks, a big improvement. When they stop the treatment, they actually get worse. You, know, you see they get a bit worse. But then the patients were given a compassionate device to use at home. And amazingly enough, they all got better again. So basically, for Alzheimer's and dementia, you probably, it's going to be a lifelong therapy. So you can show good improvements after some weeks, um, you're probably gonna have to keep using it forever. But in a trial, that's difficult to study. But this was a big improvement. This was 
many times bigger than the improvement seen with the best drugs for Alzheimer's disease, which are not very good drugs. Um, this is a study from Farzad in Iran, who had three kinds of uh, PBM, uh, red and near infrared, light helmet, a body pad, and an intranasal device. Uh, again, 10 hertz pulsed wave uh, in the left nozzle, uh, 25 minutes per session. And you see them. And single patient, but he got a lot better. So uh, these are quite big jumps in various uh, cognitive tests, you know, 15, 92. These are big differences. Interestingly, um, if you have uh, Alzheimer's disease, your sense of smell goes, and if you get fitted by modulation, um, the sense of smell comes back. So that kind of shows that the neuroprogenitor cells are fixing things in the brain because the sense of smell is highly dependent on brain repair. Um, this was a study from uh, Fred Schiffer. Uh, for depression and anxiety. Again, it was quite a long time ago, but he gave a single treatment to the head and then gave them depression and anxiety scales two and four weeks after. This here, you see, this was actually uh, double blind. So this was measuring the cerebral oxygenation with this uh, device here. And that was significant and as I say, double blind. But this was uh, the psychological questionnaires. But all 10 patients improved at the two week point from baseline. Uh, again, it was a single treatment to the head. So four weeks later, the improvement was starting to wear off. Um, this is Paolo Cassano's study who did six treatments for depression and anxiety over uh, three weeks. And again, you know, the scores slowly improved over the whole period. So this, uh, well, there's improvement after the first bit anyway, but you know, it keeps on improving for some time after the end of the application. Again, this was 810 nanometers to the forehead. Uh, Parkinson's disease, this was work from Australia, where they have these light helmets. Um, you put these light helmets on the head. Uh, all wavelengths, red, near infrared. Um, what you see is that if the color is green for these um, measurements that you can because everybody's symptoms are different in Parkinson's. That makes it a bit difficult to really do a, a trial. But anyway, the problems they had at the beginning were either no change or improved. Nobody symptoms got worse, any of them. The vast majority improved after, I think this is four weeks treatment, I believe, twice daily, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, this is another study from Fred Schiffer because he was interested in opioid addiction and he used the same system that I showed you with the depression study. And again, there's a scale in uh, opioid craving score. I don't know exactly how they measure it, but they have psychiatrists have scales for all these things. So if you are an opioid addict, um, simply putting near infrared light on the head can significantly reduce your cravings. Um, they, half of them had a, a big decrease, whereas the sham, there's only a few had a decrease. So that was statistically significant, which is sort of interesting because opioid addiction is a real big deal. And the fact that we think photobiomodulation can increase synaptogenesis or neuroplasticity. This 
is how you manage to treat opioid addiction because you get these pathways fixed in the brain when you take opioids. And the only way to really cure opioid addiction is to rewire the brain and photobiomodulation may be able to do that. Um, so this is now back to healthy adults, even though we're older adults, but everybody, as you get older, your cognitive function suffers a little bit of a decline, unfortunately, your memory and your sort of reaction time and what have you. And the big change here was in the uh, category fluence test. So this is when you, you're asked to do things like uh, name as many animals beginning with B as you can in 30 seconds or something. Uh, and the ones that had the photobiomodulation could name three times as many things in the category, which is a big, big change, actually. And this was another study from Agnes in Hong Kong. We used photobiomodulation to the forehead before or after they performed an the N back test, another cognitive function test. Um, the three back is actually quite difficult to do, but um, during the tests, she measured the amount of brain power measured by hemodynamic responses it needed to do the test. So this helmet has both the sensors for the blood supply plus the LEDs to do the photobiomodulation. And what Agnes found is that older adults didn't get necessarily better at doing the test, but it did require a lot less consumption of brain energy, if you will, to do the test. So here, this measures the amount of blood flow to the brain. The ones that didn't get the light could do the test, but it needed a lot more brain power, whereas the ones that did get the light could do it with less brain power. So that's sort of interesting. Um, another study from Agnes in, these are people with mild cognitive impairment, so older folks, but they're just on the sort of verge of developing dementia or Alzheimer's or what have you. Um, so their memory's going basically, but the ones that got the light did a lot better in visual memory and verbal memory, not this one, but most of them, their memory was a lot better. 18 sessions of PBM twice a week for nine weeks uh, on the forehead. So there's a lot of these devices now people are describing for photobiomodulation. These are ones that are published. There's some fancy helmets available now by various manufacturers because People are realizing that putting light on the head can have so many different beneficial effects and there's virtually no side effects or downside. Um, Paolo did a study looking at side effects. It was occasional headache, occasional person that found it difficult to get to sleep, but the vast majority, there were no adverse effects at all. There's a lot of common pathways in neurodegenerative and psychiatric diseases. Um, neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, cytotoxicity, mitochondrial dysfunction, neuronal apoptosis, um, low BDNF, impaired neurogenesis, uh, impaired synaptogenesis. You know, in the end stage, the hippocampus shrinks, and at the really end stage, the whole cortex shrinks. And all these brain conditions can eventually lead to big problems with your brain. So being able to benefit BDNF, neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, and all these things over here can help a lot with brain disorders. Um, you can classify them into traumatic, so there's, as I say, stroke, TBI, but 
If you have a heart attack, the supply of blood to your brain can be halted and get brain damage. As I say, the birth trauma, we talked about that, people in a coma. Uh, a lot of psychiatric disorders, depression, suicide, anxiety, PTSD, addiction, insomnia, people have shown all of these can be benefited. A lot of neurodegenerative diseases, not just Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but uh, ALS, various kinds of dementia, uh, CTE, which you get, sports players get when they have head impact, um, Kreuzfeld, Jakob, Huntington's disease, and even neuro neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism and ADHD, people are starting to treat these with photobiomodulation to the head. We published a book recently, Photobiomodulation in the Brain, which has got quite a lot of chapters from all the folks working in this field. So the conclusions, photobiomodulation is a history of over a hundred years. The mechanisms of PBM are becoming understood. And a lot of animal studies of TBI and other brain disorders. And a lot of investigators have done clinical studies acute and chronic TBI, Alzheimer's, depression, opioid addiction, and cognitive enhancement. So uh, this is my lab at Mass General. I left there a couple of years ago, come back to the UK. Now, I'm now affiliated with the University of Johannesburg. Um, various people that funded our research over the years, and I thank you all for listening.